Well, hello, folks, and welcome back to another It's Not Rocket Science lesson with Lindsay Setchell. And the point of these lessons is that we are trying to make hoof care understandable, simple to understand to horse owners, because horse owners are the people who are having to look after their horses every single week when the hoof care professional has gone. When that hoof care professional comes along and he does the feet, or she does the feet, they then disappear for six weeks or thereabouts, that's the average, and it's the horse owner that then has to deal with the aftermath of what's happened with that hoof care. And usually it should be a situation where a hoof care professional, when they turn up, really is just co-trimming. That's all they're meant to be doing. All they're doing is they're coming along, the horse is sorting their own feet out, a healthy foot, and we're just taking away the excess that Mother Nature would take away if these animals were out there doing their own thing, marching quite a lot of miles a day, sorting their own feet out. That's what we should be doing. But unfortunately, the equine world has gone far, far further than that. The equine world, unfortunately, has decided to employ what we call, and you've heard it before, PPT. PPT is personal preference trimming. Now, it's not based on evolution. It's not based on that 55 million years of evolution. It's actually based on perception. It's actually based on unsubstantiated theories and hypotheses. And what we're going to do in this It's Not Rocket Science lesson is we're going to talk about a subject that the whole internet is losing their head over, which is, let's get it up there on the board, the long toe. This Ever since we've been doing our It's Not Rocket Science lessons and ever since we opened the Phoenix Group, which is incredible, by the way, and growing so fast, ever since we've done all of those things, people have been going on and on about how bad it is that this long toe theory is going to cause problems for horses worldwide. We've been lumped into this, this group of people who are the long toe cult, is what we're being called now. The long toe cult stroke nutters, I think, is, is what we're being called. So in this It's Not Rocket Science lesson, we're going to talk about the toe. So the very first thing we're going to look at is indeed the toe, what that means to the horse, what it is, so that you can understand that. The next thing we're going to talk about is lever forces. Are lever forces so active that if you leave a toe in place on the ground, like Mother Nature suggests, that it's actually going to be detrimental to the horse and it's going to tear the capsule to a point where it's going to cause terrible pain for that horse. Is that what's happening here? We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about chopping off toes. Now, we've talked about this before, you know we have, and if you go back and look at my videos, you'll see those videos and how we've talked about that. And these two, I have to tell you, go together. The belief system with this means that a lot of people go around doing that. Not a lot of people. The majority of people in the equine world believe this, believe this, and so therefore do this. And what's been quite amusing recently is that there have been people coming out whose feathers have been ruffled, coming out into the big wide world going, no, this is still okay. All you people following Hoofing Marvelous and those people that in the track liveries who are rehabbing their horses safely, calmly, kindly, soundly. No, 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 you're wrong. You're wrong because I've been doing this for years. I've been chopping off toes for years and it has to be right. Certain scientists have said so. So therefore it's got to be right. Remember guys, 55 million years of evolution 55 million years of evolution cannot be disproved by one or two papers that do not have an absolutely definite answer to the end of them, a definite conclusion. They don't. Because unfortunately in equine research, and we talked about this before, is that rarely do you have a situation where you remove all the variables that are causing that horse to have issues and then you can study one thing. Luckily, we've done that and we can do that. And guess what? 
it's all coming out against this, the toe chopping. And if you are one of those people that goes out and does this and you're happy with that, then, you know, carry on. But what we've seen are some terrible things related to this, these beliefs. And we're going to talk about that today. And we're also going to finally talk about leaving the toe. That's us. That's us bad boys out there causing terrible pain with these horses because we're leaving the toe. How awful is that? How awful that we've, we've looked at 55 million years of evolution and gone, do you know something? I think Mother Nature got it right. I don't think we should be intervening. But hey, let's see if actually what we're saying is true. Let's get into our It's Not Rocket Science with me on toes. All right, let's get rid of my rocket. Let's just leave that up on the board. Let's see if we can leave that up on the board so that we know that it's there. So the first thing we're going to look at is the toe. So let's understand this first, because remember, this is for horse owners. We want horse owners to understand what's going on with the foot. Now, rarely do you get a situation when um, a vet, for instance, will come and look at your horse and they look from the top. They look down at the horse's foot. They're looking down here. They're looking this way. They're, they're, there's your eyes and you're looking down on the outside of the foot. And these professionals sadly haven't spent a lot of time, the majority of them, on understanding the natural foot. And in this day and age, out in the big wide world of the domestic horse, we don't see that that often, to be fair, because what we see are pathological feet, usually. Pathological feet that have either been caused to be problematic or pathological feet because of diet and management. That's the majority of things that we see that have been in shoes, etc. And they have issues. You can't view that as a natural foot. But when we look at the foot from above, you can't make a ton of assumptions, people do, but you shouldn't make a ton of assumptions. What you should do is you should pick the foot up and you should look at it from below because only then can you tell if the foot is balanced. You can, from heel to heel and from heel to toe, which is incredibly important, only then can you tell if the hoof wall has been left in place or if the hoof wall has been removed. Only then can you truly tell whether the toe and the wall and the heels and the bars are well above the natural constant of the hard sole plane or not. That's the only way that you can tell is by taking the foot and turning it upside down. So you can't do that. Anybody that comes along and looks at your foot from above, pick the foot up. So I apologize again for my appalling drawings. All right, so this roughly is the bottom of the horse's foot. Here is the frog and here are the bars. And the bars actually only go so far down the horse's foot. But we often see bar material going down as far as this. This is how far we see bar material. And sometimes all the way around the toe. That's what we call a monobar. And this material here is a mixture of bar material that's just been excess, it's just kept going, it's just kept growing, plus sole material. And it usually gets compacted and um, it's, it, it shouldn't be there. It wouldn't be there if the horse was doing its natural thing. It wouldn't. And, and bars is, is a whole other, it's not rocket science lesson. Anyway, okay, frog, bars. Now we've got the true tip of the frog here. Oftentimes when you look at a horse's foot, you don't see the true tip of the frog. Sometimes the frog looks like it's down here a bit. It's, it's elongated, it's overgrown. But the true tip is always there underneath. It's just that you can't see it. Also, sometimes when you see a very poorly foot, well, actually, you don't tend to see those because they tend to be chopped off. But we, when we see a poorly foot and we come to a foot, it looks like the frog is set far back. But in fact, the frog is where it needs to be. And it's always where it needs to be. The true point of the frog never changes. That's where it's meant to be. And around about a centimeter in front of that, if you, if you extrapolate back into the hoof, is where the distal edge of P3 is, the coffin bone, the distal phalanx. And that never, ever changes. 
And this is why the theory of rotation, when rotation is just, P3 is just swinging about in the capsule there because the lamina have been stretched, doesn't hold tight. Because if P3 is doing this and the point of, and it, it, it sits in front of the point of the frog, then P3 should do that and frog shouldn't change. But in actual fact, what happens is this, it moves with the frog. Again, another lesson, and I'm sure I have done lessons on that in the past. So, so here we are. So we, we're looking at the bottom of the, the foot, the basic foot. Now here we've got, going all the way around, oops, we've got the hoof wall. Inside the hoof wall, and uh, we have the white line. Here we go. Now it's rarely white. It usually looks a bit dirty. It doesn't look white. It, it can look very tight, which is how it should be, or it can look quite stretched. And the more stretched it looks, the more that you can see the lamina and the white line horn, and the more that that becomes a confused mass and starts to get infected. But we're not talking about that today. That's it, perhaps for another lesson. So we have, we have the hoof wall. Here we go, hoof wall. And that's divided into two. You have the inner hoof wall and the outer hoof wall. This is the outer, obviously, here. This is the outer hoof wall. I'm not going to go all the way around. And this bit here that's bright white is the inner hoof wall. Sometimes the outer hoof wall is pigmented. Sometimes it's marbled. Sometimes it doesn't have any pigment. It just depends on the genetics of the horse and whether that horse has got melanin injected into its intertubular horn or not. So we have this hoof wall. We have the outer, we have the inner. That's how Mother Nature designed the foot. That is how Mother Nature designed the foot. Then we have the white line. So this is this bit here. This is the white line. Rarely do you have a situation where you can actually see that it's bright white because you can't. It usually looks pretty dirty, but that's okay as long as it's healthy and it isn't stretched because that's indicating that you have a problem. So this white line you can compress it. it. You can put your fingernail into it, and we do this with people on our owners on our workshop, and you can push your finger into that white line. It's relatively soft. It's made up of the epidermal lamina that's coming down, that's, that's gone past its dermal guide, and it's also made up of white line horn that is created by the dermal lamina. That's what it's made up of, and it's affixed together. It's the glue between the wall and the sole, and it's very, very important. So important, but it's not a structure that should be walked upon. It shouldn't, because it's soft, and Mother Nature knows that. So Mother Nature's gone, nah, ha, ha, we've created this tough, really tough hoof wall that the horse can walk around on. Now, there's been loads of theories out there about you mustn't walk on the wall. The horse is going to again tear because we've got forces going on. It's going to tear the wall away. And, and we've even seen horses' hooves where they've actually removed the hoof wall all the way around and left the horse walking on its sole. It's not how Mother Nature designed the foot. It wasn't designed to do that. But that's what we've seen, all on the basis of it shouldn't be. Now, there are scientists out there that, that go on and on and on about lever forces, and people take it to extremes. They always do when they take these, this information that these scientists put out there to extremes. And some of this is very old science that has never been totally substantiated at all through enough testing and enough variables. It's just never been done not in the equine world. So some people remove that and we come along and go, no, 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 you shouldn't remove it. But it's important you understand a few things. The hoof wall should not be above the hard sole plane. The hard sole plane is that horse is constant. So that is the hard part of the sole. It's the insensitive sole, not the sensitive sole. That's the dermal part of the foot that's vascular and that, that's where the papillae live in the sole. This is the hard sole. This is solar plates that have been produced by those dermal papillae that have compacted and they're in like plates. You can see it because you see like a crazy paving at the bottom of the horse's foot. And they compact and that compacts to a certain thickness and that depends on the horse because all horses, depending on their genetics, will have different thicknesses. So we've got the hard sole plane, we've got the white line, and we've also got the hoof wall. And the hoof wall was never designed for the horse to be above that hard sole plane because that would make that structure weak. That would make the structure 
able to be chipped and we see that all the time when horses go barefoot and they're not getting the correct trim we see quarters etc being left and the quarters will chip and that's because those quarters that wall have not been brought down to the hard sole plane so it's important that the walls are down at the hard sole plane so that the whole structure can work together and the whole structure is, is doing what it should do. And it's feeding back because this is about a biological organism that's feeding back information constantly to the cells that are within, to the cells that produce the horn, to the brain, because the brain has to know where the foot is. It is a biological system. It is an intelligent system. And we forget that because we think our intelligence which oftentimes is actually just a dollop of stupidity, we think our intelligence supersedes the intelligence of a system that was designed over 55 million years. 55 million years. Humans didn't get on the earth till 200,000 years ago, and we didn't domesticate horses till between four and 6,000 years ago, depending on who you read. They used to think it was 4,000 years ago, and now they think it's six. That's how short our life has been with understanding the horse. And yet horses stopped evolving 1.5 million years ago and they've been doing very well, thank you very much, in the areas that, that they were evolving in. But here, we decide that we're gonna come along and we are gonna wreck that because we are not gonna believe mother nature. We are going to believe something else, us, our intelligence. Okay, so that needs questioning. So we've understood the bottom of the foot. We've understood the toe. There's one more thing to tell you about that. When we're in our workshops, we ask people to hold their hands up. So do that now. Hold your hands up and look at your hands. All right. And when you look at your hands, you can see that the shape of your hand is, is more raised to the medial side. Now, I'm not suggesting that the horse's foot is our hand. But what I'm showing you is that it's not entirely symmetrical all the way around. And this is often the case with the horse's foot. And that's because the horse will have, and I've left that red there, the horse will have an area that is actually his pillar of support. I haven't made that up. That is just life. And it varies. It can be two sides it can be very even or it can just be on one side it can be closer towards the toe but it's usually within this region here and it's this part here that is what we call active so it's active always active when the horse puts his foot down it is always active so we have the two heels and we have a point at the toe that is always active when that horse puts his foot down. Then that doesn't matter whether that horse has got stretch white line or whether the horse has got a nice tight white line or as we usually see somewhere in between. They always still have their pillar of support. It's important because that's how they walk. And if you've spent enough time around horses hooves, picking them up, looking at them, trimming them, you'll see it. They don't look symmetrical. That's just the way it is. It's their natural footprint. But unfortunately, with traditional hoof care, we, don't, we, do, we ignore this. We ignore these pillars of support. And what we do is we just blindly go in there and we, we start doing things to the horse's foot without thinking about these pillars of support. So they are very important. And they're very important to our next section, which is lever forces. So we've done the toe. We've looked at the bottom of the foot. We've seen that the horse has hoof wall and he has an inner hoof wall and an outer hoof wall. And the horse is actually meant to be walking on the inner hoof wall. That's what mother nature tells us. So then when mother nature tells us this, we can go in and we can look at the biology of that. And then we can see, ah, yes, mother nature's correct because the inner hoof wall has these big fat horn tubules. It's not pigmented. It's more flexible. It has more water content and therefore it is a better structure to walk on instead of the outer hoof wall, which has less water content. The horn tubules are tinier and it becomes more brittle. That's the biology of the hoof wall. So it corroborates what mother nature says. Mother nature says, yeah, and we see these horses that have never been touched by human hand. That indeed are all walking around on that tiny little bit of inner hoof wall. Oh, that doesn't mean to say, folks, that the rest of the hoof wall isn't used. This is what we call passive. 
This is active wear, it's actively wearing, but it doesn't wear away, it keeps being reproduced. And so does all of this, but this is what we call passive wear. Again, that can be another lesson. But it doesn't mean to say it doesn't get worn. Of course it does when the horse goes over lots of undulating terrain. All right, so we've done the toe. Let's get into lever forces and chopping toes because this is the big thing, right? This is the crux. This is all over the internet right now. Like I said, we're the long toe nutters that are out there leaving toes. How could we do that? How awful it must be straining tendons. It must be spraining ligaments. It must be causing the DDFT to go haywire and the horse must be in agony. This is terrible. How could we be doing it? Well, let's talk about it. So let's just remove the words pillar of support here. Now, very recently, there was a post put out on Facebook that talked about a certain scientist and how he'd done some studies and he believed that if you left the toe on the ground, that in fact, right here at the, uh, at the toe, then in fact, the horse is going to be in danger of, of damaging P3. That's a really interesting concept because it isn't what we have found ever. When we have followed Mother Nature's constants, we've never found that. We have never found that through 55 million years of evolution, if we start putting our own slant on it with a little bit of PPT, personal preference trimming, then in fact that saves the horse from having this issue. Conversely, you could say, well, we've been leaving the toe for years and we've never had trouble with the pedal bone either. But there's another thing you need to think about is that by leaving the toe in play, you are protecting P3. You're not causing P3 to potentially have damage because there are only so many kinds of osteo issues you can get. And the one that P3 suffers from the most is osteonecrosis. Osteonecrosis. And osteonecrosis is when the A bone lacks blood supply. It happens in it humans, it happens in organisms with bones because this necrosis part basically is bone death. It dies when that bone has its blood supply cut off. And that's bad. And in my life as a hoof care professional and in all the people that we've taught, what we can definitely tell you is that when you follow Mother Nature's guidelines and you leave the toe in place, now we're not saying leaving it above the hard sole plane or, it, or, or out of balance, let's not twist the narrative, we're just saying that you leave this in place, you do not get that. It does not happen. Osteonecrosis doesn't happen to P3 because the horse's foot is in the correct position. Osteonecrosis happens when P3 is put under pressure, when that circumflex artery is put under pressure. Everybody knows that, or the people in science should and do most know that. That's put under pressure, this starts to have problems and it starts to get remodeled. And it can get remodeled up here in the capsule too, with actually quite a bit of, of, of sole underneath, if the pressure is directed straight up towards P3. We have pulled apart, I cannot tell you how many cadaver hooves, and we've cut them in half and looked at them. And we are seeing an alarming increase in this. And I have to tell you, as a barefoot specialist and as somebody who truly believes that the natural foot is indeed the way to go, I'm appalled, actually, at the barefoot world. I've been producing the Barefoot Horse magazine for years and years, and I have met an awful lot of people, and I've seen a an awful lot of case studies. And the people that tend to come to us are people who don't shout very loud about what's going on in their horse. These are people who have had really big problems and yet they're being told by professionals that you still gotta keep on doing the same thing that's causing those horses problems. These are people with little voices that don't shout out very loud. And one of the reasons that we get accused of being quite loud is because we speak up for those people, for those people who daren't speak up because they're frightened of professionals, they're frightened of talking back to the professional, and they're frightened of saying to the professional, after your trim, my horse was sore, and he was sore for about three weeks, and then he got better, then you came back and he got sore again, until eventually they get so fed up with it, they search for a different path. Those people have little voices. They don't say an awful lot. 
because they're frightened to. And what we see is that those people come to us and we take them on as clients. We start doing what we know. And it's not just about the trim. Come on, guys. It's about the diet and management. The owner needs to own up to owning that too, of course. But we come along and we do what we do and we don't have this. Oh, we might have turned up and it might have already been there, the osteonecrosis, but we don't cause it by leaving the toe on the ground. It doesn't happen. Also, we don't cause this uh, theory that's out there that if you leave the toe on the ground, you're going to elongate P3. That somehow P3 is going to remodel itself because you've left the horse in a balanced position from heel to toe, totally balanced like mother nature would do. And then it's because you've done that, you've left toe in play, you're going to get an elongation of the coffin bone. We have never found that. When we have trimmed to mother nature's constants, guys, thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hooves, we've never found it. What we find is an awful lot of that. Now, I could be stood here making that up, but why would I? Because I'm going to tell you something now that I used to do. I used to be part, and I'm not proud of it, the toe chopping brigade. That's what I did. And let's call them that because we're being called a long toe cult, which is rather disingenuous. So if you're not into leaving toe, then therefore you must be part of the group of people that believe in toe chopping. So did I. And the reason I believed in that is because I followed the same people that these people follow. I did. All those big names in science, I followed them. When I was a fledgling person going out there and learning the craft of the foot, I did that. And what I would routinely do is this. Right on the edge of the white line. That's what I would do. Now, I didn't take it any further than that, but yeah, I did do that. And sometimes we had some stretch, big stretch, because these horses were very laminitic and I'd still come all the way back to the soul. And I'm not proud of that, actually, I have to say. But I did it. And despite what I did, probably in spite of me, because I got the diet and the management right, some, and it is some, horses recovered to, to, be, to be quite good. But some horses didn't, and I would be forever chasing my tail. And these horses would have to be in boots or pads because they were sore. They really weren't those rock crunching horses that I expected them to be. And I was confused because I was being told that this was what you should do. And I was told that because of this. Because if I don't, this is going to continue tearing because it's going to put force on that toe and it's going to tear those lamina apart and that you are then going to be in deep trouble and you're just going to perpetuate this mechanical laminitis or these mechanical issues for the horse. And if you don't take this toe back, you're going to strain those tendons and sprain those ligaments. You're really going to put the horse into deep problems. So I did it. I wasn't happy with it. I didn't feel comfortable with it. And thankfully, I didn't do it for very long. I completely had disregarded 55 million years of evolution and Mother Nature's constants. I thought I knew better because I was being told that that was the right thing to do. But the more owners that said to me, my horse's foot sore, Lindsay, it's not, he's not, he doesn't feel good the more I started to think. Now, during all of this time, as my clientele was growing enormously, I didn't have an awful lot of time for my own horses, sadly. And that tends to be the way that it goes, doesn't it? And so what happened was that I had horses that I, I hadn't trimmed for a while. And what some of these horses were quite laminitic when they came to me. I changed the diet, I changed the management. I'd originally done trims like this and, and away they go. They never had that rock crunching sound, but it was okay. I was being told that this was the right thing to do, so I should do it. So I, I let, and I had track systems up. I was one of the first people in the UK to put up extensive track systems and teach about track systems. And so I did this. 
And then one day I came back to trim my horses and I wasn't happy about this. I'd had a client on the phone telling me that after I'd done this trim, a horse was sore and I didn't like it. And I was upset with myself because I felt that I'd caused that horse harm. So I was sad and I thought I'm going to do some trimming. And I went out and I started gathering in my extensive amount of horses of all kinds of different breeds up to 20 at one point of so many different breeds not just one breed not a study on one breed lots of different breeds and i noticed something that these horses were sound hammering around these quite tough tracks and that they didn't bring their toe back beyond the white line or into the white line never they only ever brought their toe back to the waterline, those that didn't really need trimming, because many didn't need trimming. Still to this day, my horses out there that I, that I have, when I go to trim them, never have I ever found a horse bring their foot back beyond, into that white line, beyond the waterline. I've never found it. Now, these people out here in this, in this world that are chopping off toes that are still doing this, apparently they, they see that. And yet, I've seen thousands, not just me, my colleagues, our students, the hundreds of people we've taught on workshops. We've never seen it. Sure, you get, you get active wear patterns and you have areas where it looks slightly more misshapen than others, but never will they ever deliberately bring their foot back within the waterline into that white line because that's not how the foot was designed over 55 million years mother nature never did this so i started looking at my horse's feet and going hang on a minute you see that pony over there that's got had terrible laminitis and it's it's got this awful stretch white line he's walking around fine and that stretch doesn't appear to be stretching anymore. In fact, he's got a healing angle coming in. I've shown you these pictures before where you've got a toe and it's coming out like this. And here's your, here's your coronary bands. And we've got this healing angle coming in here because P3 is like this. And this healing angle is going to eventually come in and grow into the hoof capsule. These horses had healing angles. Yet their toes were way longer than I wanted them to be. And yet still, they had healing angles coming in. And now that got me thinking, now this is crazy, right? Because lever forces have told me that if I leave a horse's toe on the ground, it's going to cause all horrible things to the horse's foot. I've been so frightened of it. So I'm just going to chop, 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 because I've been told that that's what I should do. And then my eye started to see something else, that horses with laminitis when we fix the diet and the management oh yeah they had ugly looking feet sure as hell they had ugly looking feet but they were still getting in a healing angle and i'm like this this is interesting so then when i trim those horses back and i'm like i'm not going to take the toe off i don't feel comfortable with it i've had too many sore horses and i just am not comfortable with it so i decided to leave it and when I cut the horse's extra length back to just the hard sole plane, and I didn't do this, I didn't cut off the toe, I found that the lamella wedge was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I had left, I had left that toe wall in play. So the toe wall was still going up and around like this. And this was the stretched lamina. Now, I've been told lever forces cause mechanical laminitis, that this could not possibly come in the healing angle because this is being torn the whole time because we've left it and it's awful and the horse is going to be in agony and how terrible. I didn't find that. In fact, I've never found that, to be honest. The horses that I find that are in terrible agony are horses that have been subjected to unnatural hoof care practices unnatural uh, diet and management practices and have sick feet but the moment that i started leaving it and i started observing this and watching this shrink back and back and back and there was no absolutely no problem with the horse and i started studying this and started going into it in a bit more detail and going back to evolution and i started leaving this toe and I got incredible results. Not only did the horses get sounder, 
they became sound quite quickly. They didn't trip. They didn't strain their tendons. They didn't sprain their ligaments. P3 was in the right position. P3 was not in danger of osteonecrosis. These horses were rocking along. Absolutely incredible. And you know something, guys? In this world of, of hoof care, we, we cannot seem to allow a horse to have this long toe because we have been so ingrained that this is a problem. We've looked at physics and gone, it can't possibly be right. This must be tearing, yet it doesn't. And why doesn't it tear anymore? Because we are looking at the physics of biology, because intercellular and intracellular bonds are far, far greater than anything that can happen here at the toe. And it's true. But do you know something? People never, never, never try that. They don't because they have muscle memory. And that muscle memory is we need to keep removing. And it gets worse than that because not only are they removing it with horses that have wedges and you can't see the wedge then, therefore, you don't know how well that horse is recovering. And what we see in horses that we come along when they've had that removed is we just see the perpetuation of laminitis and the stretch. And then we just see P3 getting more and more rotated with this capsule that gets more and more distorted, pressure continues, and P3 starts to get osteonecrosis. We see that and we see it all the time. It's not just HM, guys. There are plenty of people in the world that have understood this, that are not going against 55 million years of evolution. Of course, it's pathological. Of course, it shouldn't be there. But we've got to respect what the biology of the foot is doing because the second that you start removing all of this you start affecting the whole equilibrium of that horse's foot sure it's ugly it doesn't look right but this does not happen they don't get worse <laughs> they get better but everybody that's in this camp here who still believes that, which is actually the vast majority of the equine world, laminitis has not been stopped, has it, guys? It hasn't. It hasn't been stopped. It's, in, it's getting worse. Pathology in the equine world is getting worse. And yet we still have these theories, we still have this hypothesis, and we're still doing it. And we still go around going, yeah, 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 it's true. We've even seen horses with beautiful, beautiful feet beautiful feet that, that Mother Nature has created, healthy, and they've had their toe chopped off right to the white line. And the people that are doing it are saying, yeah, yeah, that's, that's how it, how could you say that? How could you say that what you're doing from one or two men that have done some research that is not substantiated across the board that you think that that's the right thing to do? It's wrong, guys, and it is malfeasance. And what's happened in the big equine world is the people with the little voices are starting to get a bigger voice and they're starting to come out and they're starting to vote with their horse's feet and they're starting to say, I don't want you chopping my horse's toes back. And now, finally, now we have commercial track liveries in the UK who have gone, let's do this because we're getting so many horses with a lot of pain. Let's watch what happens when these horses turn up with horrible laminitis and we change the diet and the man management and they start to get a healing angle coming in. Wow, they do. And guess what? We've not chopped the toe off. And guess what? Those horses are hammering along, getting better and better and better. And we've pr protected P3. No longer are we going to be in a situation where we're causing P3 to have problems because the horse is not walking around on its sole, which is what happens when you chop the toe off. And not only that, the whole balance goes out of whack because you can't balance properly to the toe wall anymore. And so the balance goes out of whack. This gets thinner and thinner. It's a mess. It's a mess. This has caused a massive, massive mess. We opened up a group just over two weeks ago called the Phoenix, 
the Phoenix Way, which is what we're, we're calling Mother Nature's Way. It, we called it the Phoenix Way. It's not our method, it's studying the natural foot. It's all about the natural foot. It's about understanding the natural foot, not what we think the foot should look like, the natural foot. We started the Phoenix Way, Path to Hoof Health, and in just two weeks we had over a thousand members, people with little voices, that were coming in going, oh my God, in this group, you mean I can actually tell you what's been really going on? My horse is crippled. Every time my hoof care professional comes and does this, my horse hurts. These are the little voices. And we're going, okay, this is what you need to, and the countless pictures, pictures and pictures and pictures of horses' hooves that had their toes removed constantly, all because of these unsubstantiated theories that have never ever been able to be re repeated. This is bad. Mother Nature knows best. Evolution knows best. Now we're not purporting that you're going out there leaving feet unbalanced. That's terrible. No, 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 no. We're professionals. We leave the horse's foot balanced. But what we don't believe is the lever forces because it's not a belief, it's true. The physics of biology says that there are no lever forces tearing this so badly that it's going to keep ripping those lamina. And that is the basis of the chopping of the toes because of this desperate belief that lever forces exist to do that. They don't. Mechanical laminitis is not a thing. We have proved it. These horses would not recover at all, soundly, safely, if lever forces were tearing those lamina because this healing angle keeps on coming in guys you've only got to go and look at this, some of these track liveries like Galsworth who are proving it it's never been done you see because the world believes this nobody nobody other than us has ever gone leave it see what happens oh my goodness the horse is safe the horse is sound p3 is safe nobody's done it all these people losing their heads over all of this haven't done it. And if they have, let me tell you, if they tell you they have, yes, yes, I've left it and it was awful and he, he strained this and he strained, well, we've never found it. So either you're not telling the truth or what you're doing is that you're not trimming correctly. You're not balancing properly because this is what we see. We are being the voice for these people with these little voices that can't shout loud because nobody's listening. We are there for them. In this last three weeks alone, we have placed more of our students and professionals with owners who have come to us going, please help, my horse is in a desperate state and I've been doing this, this, this and this and it's not been working. We go, show us the pictures, they show us the pictures and it's always the same story. The toes have come back, the heels sometimes are high. It's a mess. It's a mess. And the horses are sore. It's a mess, guys. Hoof care in the equine world is a mess. Now you can keep losing your heads over it, calling us names and doing whatever it is that you want to do to try and shout us down. But I know, I know because I've been in this barefoot world an awful long time now. I know that nobody ever tries to do this. So the people that come out and say that have never properly tried to do it. And now we're showing the world it is true. It can be done and it is normal and fine and good and makes the horse sound. And they are absolutely fine and the healing angle grows out because now we're showing them. We're showing the world that it works. It's not a hypothesis. These are real live animals that are showing the world that if you do what mother nature says and let the foot work together, no matter how stretched that toe is, then these horses recover and they recover fast and they have no danger of having P3 being damaged by osteonecrosis. So guys, leaving the toe means respecting mother nature's constants, respecting the natural foot. 55 million years of evolution, I am not gonna go around and go, mother nature, you don't know what you're talking about. I think I need to do this. 55 million years of evolution tells you that she got it right. She didn't get it wrong. Horses are not a design flaw. Horses are not something that need to be, need a human to come along and go, that's all wrong. No, 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 no. What they need is a human to understand the diet, the management, we can keep it more species specific and they need to understand the foot more. They've never done it, you see. The world's never done it. And now we are, and now we're proving it. 
I hope that helped. I hope my It's Not Rocket Science lesson on the toe and the long toe and the chopping the toe helped. If you want to know any more information, you want to see some of those stories, join our group, the Phoenix Group, the Phoenix Group Path to Hoof Health, because what we do is follow the natural hoof. So join us, come in, have a look. We've got loads of professionals joining too, because they aren't happy either. The people with the small voices, they're getting the bigger voices. So look out world, it's coming. Change is coming. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.